thank you for having me. It's a very tough uh, thing to follow Andrew Lawton on, on the stage, especially since uh, English is not my native language. Um, um, I'll get to you for that, uh, uh, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so shall, we, shall you start my, my slides, please? First of all, I, I'd like to say that I'm an economist, so I'm not a specialist in constitutional law. But I was, uh, I was asked to talk about uh, the Quebec experience, in fact, in, uh, in uh, gaining some autonomy inside the Federation. So that's, that will be my topic. We're coming. You're coming? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so before I get my slides, I'd just like to say that uh, gaining some autonomy, some level of autonomy inside the Federation does not mean that you'll necessarily be better. For example, I think that Quebec did not do very well with some areas in which it got, it got more autonomy. So it's going to be up to you to, uh, to do better if you're, uh, you have more powers. Okay, so uh, how do we do here? Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> or i just do this. Okay, so uh, independence, I think, is a worthy goal. Um, uh, this being said, uh, I, I'm not here to push for uh, independence. Um, uh, and uh, I'll start with uh, maybe a few words about my, my last year's uh, presentation when I talked about how to, how to, how to do independence, in fact, how to, uh, to get there. So next one, please. Okay, so Alberta has problems. Uh, uh, first, firstly, um, you're in, not in a um, federal majority anymore. In fact, the federal liberals can get a, a, a majority government without Alberta. And let's face it, that's what's been happening. Okay, good, thanks. Um, hmm. I'm not seeing right, very well right here my slides. Could I get a microphone? Is this one working? Okay, good. Okay, so uh, contrary to Quebec, the West is not willing to vote for different parties. Uh, Quebec has switched its vote many, many times, and this, this helps a lot, uh, uh, Quebec. Um, uh, so um, uh, the recent federal majorities in Quebec were the Bloc, the Liberals, NPD, um, uh, uh, the PCP, and uh, uh, the Bloc again, uh, uh, in fact, right now. So uh, all parties are vying for Quebec votes, and that's not the case um, uh, uh, in Alberta. So that's, that creates a problem. Um, also, the rest of Canada right now is preventing the West from attaining its potential uh, through pipelines. Uh, but also, um, uh, let's face it, um, uh, rules uh, relating to trade in Canada, internal trade, are, uh, are really bad. In fact, perhaps uh, if uh, Alberta was a, 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 an independent country, it would get uh, the, well, the, the WTO, the World Trade Organization rules, and these would be more liberal, in fact. They, they, they encourage more trade than what we have in Canada. For example, it's easier for a, uh, um, a winemaker in BC to sell uh, its wine uh, to someone in Texas than, than to someone in Quebec or in, in Ontario right now. So um, th these are s certainly reasons that, uh, why you might uh, uh, think uh, about uh, secession in, uh, uh, in the future. Not working. So next one, please. So what to do? So this, uh, uh, the second slide from my uh, presentation from last year, from 2019. Well, first of all, send credible messages right now. Uh, uh, so uh, if you want to do uh, uh, independence, you have to be taken seriously. Uh, and one, of, uh, one way of doing that is opting out whenever possible in our programs where you can do it. 
Um, secondly, uh, uh, but we're not there yet, but if you ever want to go towards independence, you'll have to do a referendum. And um, don't do one unless you're reasonably sure to win it, uh, and to win it big also. Um, uh, uh, and you need to, have to plan for a loss. And this is something that obviously Quebec did not do. They lost two referendums, and they lost a lot of leverage because of, uh, of that. Uh, make the tent as large as possible. Uh, so this means uh, uh, don't make the independence movement the movement uh, only for conservatives, but make it for uh, as many people as possible. Uh, Quebec, uh, in the PQ in 1995, had a very large tent, uh, including a lot of people from the right, in fact. And, and in 2006, uh, uh, and, and we had an election in which the PQ boldly told everyone, we don't want people from the right in our party. So the tent has shrunk and independence has, uh, let's say, faded, faded away. And that's one of the reasons, I believe. And answer your plan in advance. For example, a Wexit after two years, whatever, uh, whatever happens with negotiations. So think about Brexit. Uh, Brexit happened because, in fact, they, they said, well, we're going to do Brexit in, uh, at that time, uh, at that date exactly, and negotiations are not. And it worked, in fact, for, uh, for Britain. Uh, have agreements with First na Nations before and have them on your side. That's, I think, very, very important, especially with, what, with, with uh, what's going to happen in the near future uh, if the Liberals uh, do what they, they're planning to do, which is to uh, integrate the uh, United Nations uh, uh, thing about um, uh, Aboriginals in, into laws in Canada. This is going to be very, very complicated for everyone and um, uh, find international allies also. But I will not be talking about all this, I'll be talking about opting out, which is, uh, I believe, a first step in, uh, in all this. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so I'll be talking, uh, I have too, too many slides, so I'll uh, sk maybe skip over, and my, my slides will be available if uh, Danny wants to uh, make them available to everyone. Okay, so. Um, we have a, a constitution in Canada, the British North America Act of 1867, plus statutes, plus conventions. It, uh, uh, it contains a clear distribution of powers between the federal and provincial uh, governments. Federal powers are mainly in um, national affairs. Uh, among these, trade and commerce, direct and indirect taxation, currency, the postal service. These are all things that deal with uh, all the provinces uh, at the same time. National defense, navigation, fisheries, banking, copyright, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also, uh, there's a, a, an element in the Constitution that says that everything that deals with peace, order, and good government in Canada um, uh, so uh, this can be uh, uh, in the power of the federal government. So that's, that's a way for the federal government to, to enter a lot of areas of provincial jurisdictions. Just next slide, please. Okay, so provincial powers now. They're internal, uh, internal constitutions, direct taxation for provincial purposes, municipalities, they're creations of the provinces. School boards, which means education, because in 1867, school education was school boards. Uh, hospitals, so uh, at that time uh, it meant, uh, it, it means today um, uh, healthcare, in fact. So healthcare is a provincial jurisdiction. Property, civil rights, um, uh, the administration of, of justice, penalties for breaking provincial stat statuses, statutes, uh, prison, celebration of marriage. So marriage, uh, the law of marriage is, uh, is federal, but the celebration of marriage is provincial. Um, uh, local works, corporations with uh, provincial uh, objectives. And we also have four shared areas, agriculture, immigration, old aid pensions, and supplementary benefits. Um, yeah, and uh, education, so is a, 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 a provincial power, but uh, it's subject to certain religious guarantees. Um, for example, in Quebec, we had guarantees for uh, protestants, protestants and uh, Catholics. I'm not sure it was in, uh, in Alberta, the same thing. Okay. So that's pretty much it for the next uh, slide, please, for the Constitution. Uh, so another very important element is federal spending power. The federal government assumes that it may spend where, uh, uh, where it, do, um, uh, it does not necessarily uh, have uh, uh, the power to pass legislation. Um, uh, this means that, uh, um, and the uh, uh, Supreme Court of Canada has recognized this uh, 
power to spin. It, uh, it can decide to create new programs in areas of provincial jurisdictions, uh, uh, spend in, his, in these areas. Uh, this includes equalization payments, uh, uh, but uh, that has been enshrined in the Constitution in 1982. So that's uh, now uh, in the Constitution. But it includes health, social security, and ed education. So the, the federal government has um, entered a lot of uh, areas that were under provin provincial uh, jurisdiction over the years uh, through its, uh, um, fed, uh, its uh, spending power. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, now, uh, uh, a principle on which I've, I've written in, in, uh, in the past, in 2017 I wrote a paper with uh, Jasmine Guenet. Um, it's a principle of subsidiarity. The, it uh, basically means that uh, in a federation, you should give the powers, the, na the powers for national affairs to the federal government, and all the local affairs should go to the uh, lower uh, level governments of the provinces. So that's a very important uh, principle. Uh, it's even enshrined in the, in the constitution of the European Union, for example. So uh, uh, the European Union as itself keeps powers that uh, affect all the countries, uh, but uh, all the national affairs are, uh, are under the national governments, uh, in fact. So uh, this means that uh, the federal jurisdiction over currency, defense, uh, the provincial jurisdiction over education and health care can certainly be uh, uh, explained by, uh, uh, by subsidiarity. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so another, uh, let's say a corollary of the principle of subsidiarity is the financing of services by uh, uh, the authority that dispenses them. That means that if uh, there's a national um, uh, area uh, of power, it should go to the federal government, and the federal government should tax people in order to finance these, uh, uh, these things. If something goes under, uh, uh, in fact, it does not go to the federal government, it should go to the prov provinces, and then the provinces should be the ones that tax this. And this rule, basic rule of subsidiarity, is broken all the time in Canada. Whenever the, gov the federal government taxes all Canadians, and uh, subsidizes the, the, the provincial governments uh, to, to uh, render services. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so that's, that's one problem, uh, and, it, uh, and it creates a lot of, uh, uh, of other problems. For, for example, um, uh, consumers are better served by um, competitive markets. Well, it's the same thing for, for people. So if you have different uh, programs in different uh, provinces, well, you can uh, always uh, vote with your feet by moving to another province that uh, serves you better. Another reason for um, uh, the principle of subsidiarity is that decentralization make, uh, makes uh, political decision makers more accountable. Uh, in fact, they, uh, they, um, yeah, they're closer to the people in the provinces. And also, the principle of subsidiarity makes politicians more attentive to the wishes of voters in their region. So it's a, it's a basic element of federalism that we should have uh, decentralization and we sh should have uh, 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 to the federal power, uh, to the federal government, only the powers that matter nationally. For example, currency or national defense. You could not have provincial defense, for example, or uh, you could not have provincial currencies uh, in the federation. So next slide, please. Okay, so now the uh, uh, most important part of my, uh, my, my talk, opting out. So that's, that's a really Canadian thing. Uh, it does not exist, uh, as far as I know, in other, uh, in other federations. It's the uh, idea under which a province decides to remove itself from a program administered by the federal government um, or exempt itself from a, a constitu constitutional amendment also that would transfer its legislative powers to Ottawa. This means that if opting out exists, um, a, a, um, a province could withdraw from a federal program that is uh, in its areas of powers, or if there's an amendment that changes the powers of the provinces, well, a province could withdraw from that, uh, that amendment. So that exists in Canada, and it's been enshrined in the Constitution in 1982, when it was uh, uh, repatriated. Okay, so how did it all start? Well, the federal government started creating programs in the 1940s. Uh, unemployment insurance and, and a lot of others. And it continued in the 1950s a, a lot. Uh, um, 
these programs were very often in um, uh, provincial jurisdictions, but the federal government used its power to uh, uh, its uh, spending power to uh, enter these uh, jurisdictions and uh, enticed the provinces to follow by uh, sharing the cost. So it was telling the provinces, well, um, we're going to share the cost, for example, of a Trans-Canada Highway. So we want a Trans-Canada Highway. So the, the, the transport is, uh, is normally a, a provincial uh, jurisdiction, uh, unless it's be, be, uh, being done between provinces, but we'll, we'll uh, help you by, by paying part of it. So the federal government, so this um, encouraged provinces, in fact, to create uh, a national um, uh, uh, highway, uh, Trans-Canada. And it's been done in university financing also and in many other areas. Uh, hospital insurance, vacation, uh, vocational training, etc., uh, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, Quebec refused conditional grants most of the time. So this means that they left money on the table. It was not easy to do. It, it could be done because people were nationalistic, in fact, uh, uh, in Quebec. But uh, in 1959, for example, uh, Quebec received $46 million in conditional grants under these, uh, uh, these programs, while it refused a further $82 million uh, in grants. So this means that 60% of the amount available to the province had been refused in 1959. So that's a lot of money. And that accounted for uh, almost 14% of the revenues of the provincial government. So you can only do that if you have the backing of, uh, of voters. And um, the, uh, the party in power uh, was Union Nationale, which was very nationalistic under uh, Maurice Duplessis. And he died in 1959. And the liberals were elected for the first time since, uh, well, a long time, in fact. And when they came to, uh, uh, into power, they decided that they, they would, would accept this, uh, uh, this money. So um, uh, Quebec joined between 60 and 62 most joint programs that had uh, been refused uh, thus far. Uh, by 1962, 23% uh, of the budget of the government of Quebec was, was tied to joint programs. So it was a major change. But at the same time, politicians in Quebec exer uh, uh, exercised some pressure on politicians in Ottawa in order to, uh, to change the rules of the game. And they got this. Um, uh, a provin federal, federal provincial conference was, uh, was held in 1964 to design uh, a contra uh, contracting out formula which we now call opting out. It came in 1965 with the Established Programs Act. Uh, um, okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so some programs called standing programs, hospital insurance, old aid pensions, blind persons allowances, disabled persons allowances, the welfare portion of the general public assistance program, health grants, excluding uh, hospital construction, um, uh, so a lot of programs were included there. Um, also special programs uh, included agricultural uh, assistance, um, some forestry programs, hospital construction, um, uh, campgrounds, picnics areas programs, road to resources programs. Uh, uh, so uh, these were included in the contracting out uh, uh, um, agreement. Some were um, excluded. Um, uh, and you have the list uh, right, uh, uh, right there. So next slide, please. Okay, so from that moment on, pro, uh, provinces could opt out of standing programs. They would then receive an abatement on the federal personal income tax. So that means that the federal um, income tax would be reduced uh, by a certain, uh, certain percentage point, and the provinces could simply increase their, uh, their income tax rate and get the money to finance these programs that the federal government wanted. So that's what we call opting out in Canada, in fact. The only provinces that, the only province that, uh, province that asked for this and the only province that, in fact, um, um, used this uh, possibility was, was Quebec for a, for a long time, in fact. And so each program was assigned a unit value corresponding to the estimated percentage of yield, yield of these abatement, abatements in Quebec. If I'm not mistaken, uh, when I do my, uh, my income tax return, we have two in Quebec, by the way, and I'll talk about that also. I, I start by doing the federal one, and I calculate how much taxes I owe. Uh, well, I don't do that. My accountant uh, 
account, uh, accounted, does it, in fact. And, uh, well, at the end, well, I, you simply subtract 16.5% of your tax bill for the federal government. Okay, so I pay less federal taxes, in fact, than you do for, for, the, same, for the same income. Uh, and uh, the, the provincial government of Quebec, well, uh, has simply increased its taxation rate by, by the same amount so that, in fact, it gets the money to finance the programs. So this means that uh, the Quebec government, uh, uh, using this uh, formula, had the money to do the programs that the federal government wanted to, uh, to, to see implemented, but could do them uh, uh, with Quebec rules as long as they followed the general guidance of the federal, federal government. So we were so subjected to rules by the federal government. Um, at the time, a, a time limit was set to pull out of the programs, uh, a time limit of five years, so it's too late for you right now, uh, according to these rules, but uh, it, this has been changed in uh, the Constitution of 1992. So um, this, uh, in 1992, the right for any province to opt out of future constitutional amendments that would transfer legislative powers from the provincial legis legislatures to parliament was affirmed, and uh, financial compensation was guaranteed for any province that opts out of such an amendment. Uh, 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 if it uh, relates to education and other cultural matters, that was uh, something that Quebec asked, in fact. Uh, under the Meech Lake and Charlottetown Accords, which did not work out finally, in fact, something much more ambitious was to be done. Um, this uh, financial compensation was to be extended to include any constitutional amendment that transferred powers uh, not uh, uh, in, an area, uh, in, uh, in an area to, uh, to uh, the provinces, to uh, the federal government. But this, the, the, this not, did not work out, so we're, uh, we're stuck with the uh, 1982 arrangement, in fact. So next uh, slide, please. Okay, now, does this mean that a province that pulls out of an, ag uh, uh, of an agreement with the federal government and gets compensated can do whatever it wants? No, not at all. In fact, it still has to follow um, uh, the, uh, uh, the program um, uh, by uh, the federal program by giving the federal government um, uh, reports on exped expenditures. So this means that it has to spend the money uh, in what the federal government wants. Um, and uh, it has to participate in federal provincial meetings established in the, for the purpose of coordinating the programs. Uh, so uh, you don't get uh, full autonomy here. Um, so the opting out formula was written uh, to assure a province uh, of its autonomy, the, but the principle is undermined by the regulating restrictions imposed by the federal government. So it's not perfect autonomy, if you wish. So next slide, please. So, there are also um, uh, special agreements. Um, uh, for example, immigration is a shared power be between the federal and the provincial governments. Um, originally, in 1867, it was created as a, um, a shared power um, uh, because um, uh, uh, provinces wanted to make sure that they would get a certain percentage of immigrants every year in, into Canada. Uh, population was very sparse at that, sparse at that time. So, um, Quebec was the first um, uh, to sign a, um, an agreement in 1971 with the federal government in order to, um, uh, that uh, the Quebec government would have a say in uh, immigration in, into Quebec. Well, this does not mean much because people can be uh, selected by the Quebec government, come to Quebec, and after that, move to any province. We're free here, okay? But, but still. Uh, so, um, uh, first, uh, uh, in 1971, the Quebec government was authorized to post an immigration counselor in these designated countries. In 1975, um, uh, uh, Quebec got um, a role in immigrant selection, and this was announced in 1978. And in 1991, Quebec obtained the power to select all economic immigrants. So it doesn't select uh, refugees but it selects uh, all economic immigrants. Um, and uh, this, um, uh, uh, and the federal government can always overrule the selection by the Quebec government, but only for serious security or medical reasons. For example, if Quebec uh, selects a, a, a known terrorist, well, the federal government will probably uh, object. Uh, and 
And since the RCMP is the one that knows that, well, uh, there's a reason for, uh, let's say, a, a role for the federal government here. Um, so all uh, uh, in, uh, reception, integration services for new arri arrivals is, uh, is done by Quebec now. And the go federal government provides Quebec with an annual grant in order to do that. Other provinces uh, later joined in a more limited way. Alberta was an, uh, one of the last provinces to do it in 2007. And Manitoba is very aggressive in this, uh, this area. It's been selecting immigrants for a long time also. So uh, um, there are many areas in which, in fact, provinces have uh, asserted more, uh, let's say, authority. Uh, and, so, and it's good, quite possible to do it. So next slide. Um, now, uh, the uh, federal government also contracts out to the provinces, uh, uh, or the provinces contract out to the federal government some services, and we've already talked about, the, already talked about this uh, in policing, for example. Well, uh, um, the, uh, uh, this comes from the RCMP website. Um, so um, uh, there's a, an agreement that runs to 2032, uh, for policing agreements between uh, most provinces, in fact, Quebec and Ontario are uh, excluded here. Uh, and, uh, but any party can pull out every year. So if you wanted to pull out of this agreement, uh, having the RCMP do, doing policing, it could be done in, uh, in, in a year, in a year's time. It could be done very fast. Um, but uh, there's an, uh, the federal government created an incentive for this. In fact, the, uh, the, the provinces and territories pay 70% of RCMP costs, and the federal government pays 30%. And for municipalities, I think it's 90% paid by municipalities and 10% by the federal government. But still, since the federal government pays part of it, well, it's, it's an incentive, in, in fact, to, to, to leave, the, the, leave these powers with the federal government. But if you want to pull out of it, it would probably not cost much money. Let's face it. And, um, uh, and, and by the way, um, uh, provinces and municipalities es establish um, policing pri priorities, but the RCMP is res responsible for delivering on the priorities within the established budget, which, which, could mean to, uh, which could lead to the gun grab that you had a few years back, uh, for example. You would not have had that if you had, uh, had a provincial, let's say, a non-NPD provincial government. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, it's quite possible to, uh, to increase your, um, to your autonomy. There are good reasons for that. The principle of its subsidiarity um, leads us to think that the federal government should be, only be involved in national matters and should not be involved in, in local matters. Uh, for example, in healthcare, uh, the federal government should not be in there at all. Uh, well, it provides 20 to 30 percent of the um, provincial budgets, uh, in, in Quebec at least, but in many other provinces it's the same thing, I guess, and in, in, in healthcare. And this is a bad thing because it means that the federal government can uh, impose a lot of rules and provinces have to follow these rules because they want to keep the money from the federal government. Uh, uh, now, there's a role for the federal government in healthcare uh, uh, when there are pandem pandemics, for example, so that's, that's national, but otherwise it should not be involved in, uh, in these things. Uh, and, uh, and same thing in other sectors. So uh, if the citizens of, of Alberta wish to increase the autonomy of, the, of, the, uh, of their province, or if they wish to send a strong message to the rest of Canada, or if uh, they want to take a first step towards independence, uh, well, becoming more independent from the federal government should be looked at very closely, and it's quite possible to, to do it. Um, some steps are, are easy, for example, replacing the RCMP by a provincial force, well, that's, uh, that's, that's a no-brainer, in fact, and it's, uh, it's a very easy to do. Others have to be negotiated, uh, and it, it will probably take some time. But if you want to become independent, well, you have to have these, these levers of power anyway, so you might as well start right uh, now. Pulling out of the CPP, the Canada, Canada Pension Plan, uh, also is, um, is pretty simple. Uh, Quebec has done that uh, a long time ago. Uh, it created the uh, Régie des Rangs du Québec, uh, and it's never been in the Canada Pension Plan, in fact. And since uh, Quebec invests more aggressively, it does simply not 
do, does not simply buy Canada bonds, for example. Uh, it's very active. It gets a better return than the Canada pension plan. So this means that it can uh, keep rates low uh, and uh, give better pensions if, if, it, if it wants to. So uh, you could do the same thing. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, good minds in Alberta that could uh, probably uh, administer this uh, in a more aggressive, uh, more aggressive way. And also, you have a um, young population in Alberta. And, this, uh, and you earn high revenues. Uh, this means that you could certainly keep um, uh, uh, the, uh, the rates that people have to pay uh, lower than the Canada Pension Plan. So, uh, and in fact, it would probably oblige the rest of Canada to increase the rates of the CPP for the rest of Canada, if you did that. So if you got, want to give a slap to the rest of Canada, well, that's one way of doing it. Uh, so thanks to Quebec, uh, this is, is maybe a major surprise. Well, uh, a path exists to more autonomy for, uh, for Alberta. And it's your choice to, uh, to take it. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. You'll have to negotiate a lot of things. But a lot of things that were accepted for Quebec, I uh, don't see how the federal government could not accept them if they come from another province. So it's, your, um, it's simply a question of uh, political will, if you will. Okay, so that's my presentation.